stories. And at the end of each of them, I'm going to share with you a picture that is famously Ooh, associated with them. Right but before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious Three delivered in story Three format, times. and you've come to the right channel because that's all I do, and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, then please throat punch the like button and then subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. Between 1974 and 1975, a criminal who had been dubbed the Visayala Ransacker had been terrorizing the Eastern District of Sacramento, California. Initially, he would break into people's homes when they were sleeping by prying open one of their windows. He would go inside and basically ransack their house. He wouldn't steal any of the major valuables that were right in plain sight. He would just kind of throw things all over the place and would take one or two small things, probably as a souvenir. Unfortunately, by the summer of 1976, this Visayala ransacker was not only not caught, but was also no longer satisfied with just breaking into people's homes and ransacking them and taking a few things. He had moved on to killing people, and so he had been given a new nickname, one that just about everybody knew at the time, and that was the Golden State Killer. Once he began killing people, he became much more cautious about how he would actually go about attacking them. He would oftentimes break into his victims' homes while they weren't there, and he would walk their property, look for guns and unload them. He would look for any security cameras or devices and turn them off. He would plant ligatures, pieces of rope and twine that he could use to bind people's arms and legs. He would place them in their house, and then he would leave. And he would study his victims and get to know their patterns and know when they were going to be in the house, when they were going to be in certain rooms. And then at some point, he would sneak in through a window at night while they were sleeping, and their victims would wake up with him standing over them with a flashlight in their face. On the rare occasion where neighbors or police had actually spotted this guy, they saw that he was wearing a full face mask and he was very athletic. He was able to elude police capture and would jump over fences and would run away. By the end of 1976, when the Golden State Killer had still not been caught, citizens of Sacramento became furious with the police. They felt like they were not doing enough to try to catch this guy. So on November 3rd, 1976, the police actually host this huge town hall meeting and they invite all the citizens of Sacramento to come be a part of it, voice your complaints, listen to what police are actually trying to do to catch the Golden State Killer, and basically just have an opportunity to air your grievances a little bit. During the meeting, a man in the crowd who was a citizen of Sacramento stands up and basically starts making fun of the Golden State Killer, calling him weak and a coward, saying, you know, you're preying on women. If you ever came to my house, I would totally beat the crap out of you. Like, this guy's a joke. And everybody in the town hall meeting just totally ate it up. It was like this one little victory for the town of Sacramento is we're going to put down the Golden State Killer for being weak and a coward. Then, in an ironic twist of fate, that guy who was making fun of the Golden State Killer, he and his wife became the next victims of the Golden State Killer. And in fact, the Golden State Killer changed his entire MO. Instead of kind of targeting random people all over Sacramento, he began only targeting married couples, and he would always attack when the husband was home. For decades, the Golden State Killer eluded capture and even taunted the police in threatening phone calls all the way up until 2001. But in 2016, they reinvestigated the Golden State Killer case using DNA evidence, something that was not available in the 70s and the 80s when they were investigating these crimes. And it was through this reinvestigation that they were able to capture 74-year-old Joseph D'Angelo in 2018, who was, in fact, the Golden State Killer. D'Angelo pled guilty to 13 counts of first-degree murder and was given 12 consecutive life sentences. When the killer was finally identified as Joseph D'Angelo, police were going through some of the older case photos and they made a startling discovery. This is a picture from the November 3rd, 1976 town hall meeting, and there in the middle of the photo is none other than Joseph D'Angelo, a.k.a. the Golden State Killer. And he was there when that citizen of Sacramento stood up and began berating the Golden State Killer, saying how he was a coward and weak and that he would totally beat him up if he ever came to his house. And there's Joseph D'Angelo sitting there listening to this guy. And after the meeting, what does he do? He targets the guy that spoke out against him. And even after he attacked this guy, apparently he was so upset that he changed his entire M.O. and only targeted married couples from that point on, as if he was proving a point that you can't touch me. Wow. I did not know that. 
Like, I did not know that. Oh, these. Ouch. Okay, you guys, hold on one second. I'm going to okay, I'm back. Let's do this. I'm Tyler Hadley turned 15. He was skipping school regularly and hanging out with the wrong crowd. Tyler's parents had tried to do everything to get their son back on track between doctor's visits, psychiatry appointments, medication, and outpatient mental health program, but none of it seemed to work. Tyler just was on the wrong path. As Tyler's behavior continued to get worse as he got older, his parents just didn't know what to do, became very frustrated with him, and became very, very strict disciplinarians. One night when Tyler came home and he appeared to be intoxicated, his parents took his phone and car away, and Tyler was furious. And he confided in his best friend, Michael Mandel, that he thought his parents had gone over the line, that they were over-disciplining him, and he said to Michael that he wanted to kill his mother. Now. Michael knew Tyler and had known him since he was a little kid, and he did not think twice about this claim that, you know, Tyler wanted to kill his mom. He just thought that Tyler was frustrated with his parents, and Michael did know that Tyler's parents were very, very strict and hard on him. So he just kind of wrote it off. Not long after this incident, Tyler starts talking about this huge house party he's going to have. And all of Tyler's friends, including Michael, just didn't buy it. They're like, there's no way you could ever pull this off. Your parents are too strict and they never leave town anyways. But every time people approached him, oh, he would say, oh, no, my parents story. aren't going to be there. They'll never the find story. out. At some point, Michael gets a Facebook invitation to Tyler's big house party. And he sees that it's been sent to so many people. It's been sent well beyond an inner circle of friends to just total strangers. And then on the Facebook invitation itself, someone had posted on the wall, hey, Tyler, what are you going to do if your parents come home? And he responded to that, they won't, trust me. On the day of the party, Michael shows up to Tyler's house and it is packed with people. Lots of people he didn't know and he was fairly certain Tyler didn't know them either. And he goes inside and it's clear that no one gives a crap about the house itself. People are writing on the walls, people have spilled stuff all over the ground, there's broken glass on the ground, people are rummaging through the food in the fridge, no one cared about the house. And Tyler, oddly enough, didn't seem to mind at all. The only time Tyler became on edge was when he felt like the party was getting too loud. And he would go around and tell people to be quiet because he didn't want his neighbors to hear because the neighbors would call the police and he didn't want the police coming to the house. During this big party, Tyler pulls Michael aside and says, hey, I gotta tell you something, come outside with me. When they get outside, Tyler looks at Mike and just says, Mike, I killed my parents. Michael doesn't believe him, but Tyler says, no, look in my driveway, their car is still here. They did not go to Orlando, I killed my parents. Michael still didn't believe him and Tyler said, go inside, I bet if you look around you'll find blood in my house. So he goes inside and he starts looking around and when he goes upstairs he sees there's blood on a table right outside the master bedroom where Tyler's parents slept. And on the door handle to the master bedroom there was also blood. So he goes back down and he goes, Tyler, you're playing a prank on me. And Tyler goes, no, when the party dies down I'll show you proof. At this point Michael is starting to think this could actually be real. And Tyler walks away and Michael's thinking to himself, I, I can't wait till the end of this party to see if this is really true or not. So he goes upstairs, goes to the bloody door handle to the master bedroom, opens it up, and the door actually hits the leg of Tyler's father who's laying on the ground who's deceased inside of the master bedroom. He shuts the door and he's standing in the hall and he doesn't know what to do because on the one hand, Tyler's his friend, but he just discovered Tyler's a murderer. He also knew Tyler's parents really well, so he's deeply saddened by what he just saw. And as he's standing there, he's realizing that he has to turn Tyler in. And so for some reason, he just felt the need to take one more picture with Tyler because he knew as soon as he left the house, he was gonna go tell authorities what Tyler had done and he was never gonna see him again. And so he goes over to Tyler and he takes this picture. After Tyler was arrested, he admitted that just hours before this house party, he had bludgeoned his parents to death and stashed them in the master bedroom. Tyler was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. And while he has been remorseful, he's never given a real reason why he actually killed his parents. Wow. Are you looking to make music and podcasts? Well, look no further. Soundtrap is the perfect tool for you. Soundtrap is a digital audio workstation made by Spotify where you can create music and podcasts. So with that, my name is Adam, and today I'm going to show you the can... It still shocks me that Tyler would do that. Like, I know that the story I saw it from, um... 
may made documentaries um many youtubers that like talk about this this case like and it still shocks me that we have people out there that like like this like it really shocks me but yeah on the morning of Tuesday, April 20th, 1999, a Colorado high school student named Brooks Brown noted something strange. Too. His on-again, off-again friend named Eric had missed all of the classes that morning, something that is totally uncharacteristic of Eric, who was a straight-A student. At lunchtime, Brown left the high school to go to the designated smoking area in the parking lot, and he saw, parked in a very far away spot, somewhere that he never saw him park before, was his friend Eric, who was in the back of his car pulling a large duffel bag out of the trunk. Brown puts a cigarette out and walks over and asks Eric, where have you been all morning? And Eric turns to Brown and goes, it doesn't matter. I like you, so you should leave right now. Go home. Brown was taken back by his tone and the general weirdness of the morning, but Eric was always kind of a wild card. He was a guy that had, in the past, vandalized Brown's house. He had posted death threats online about Brown. And then simultaneously, he would brag to Brown all the time about different accomplishments, like he desperately wanted approval from Brown. So it was a very strange relationship they had. Brown doesn't really know what to make of this, and so he kind of just shrugs his shoulders, turns around and walks away, while Eric turns around and continues doing whatever he's doing with his duffel bag. Brown gets back over to the smoking area, and he's thinking, you know, maybe I should just skip class and go home, because maybe Eric has some prank that he's got mm -hmm. planned that he's protecting mm -hmm. me from. Mm -hmm. And as he's sitting there, smoking a cigarette, thinking about whether or not he's gonna stay or go, he hears noises coming from the high school that he immediately assumes are fireworks. And so in his mind, he's like, oh, looks like he was planning a senior prank. He's lighting fireworks inside of the school. But then the sounds got faster and louder and he turned to look at the school and he heard people screaming and he knew those weren't fireworks, those were gunshots. Brown immediately runs to the nearest house, knocks on their door, and is able to get a phone, and he calls police. After Eric had spoken to Brown, when Brown came across the lot and asked him what he was doing, and then ultimately Brown turned around and walked back to the smoke pit, Eric had turned his attention to his duffel bag. He had pulled it out and dragged it across the lot to another car where one of his other friends named Dylan was also getting his own duffel bag out of the back of his own car. Inside of their duffel bags were propane tank time bombs that they planned to place all around the school mm -hmm. in an effort to collapse the ceiling of the cafeteria because what they wanted to do is get people to start running out of the school so they could start shooting at them. Eric and Dylan's car were parked far away from their usual spots, kind of strategically located near where first responders were bound to come in, and they had rigged their cars to explode so that when they did come through, they would detonate and hopefully take out the first responders as well. Eric and Dylan had also placed another timed explosive on a field about three miles away that was purely a diversion. They were hoping it would go off. It would get police and first responders over there first, giving them more time to inflict max damage on the school. But with the exception of the diversionary bomb that did go off, none of the other explosives in the high school actually went off. So Dylan and Eric had to go to plan B, which is to walk right in the school and just start shooting. At the end of the day, 12 students from Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado had been killed, along with one of their teachers, as well as Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, the two shooters. At the time, this was far and away the deadliest American school shooting. This senior class picture was taken two weeks before the Columbine shooting, and you can clearly see Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold pointing finger guns at the camera. At the time this picture was taken, they both knew what they were going to do to the students in that picture because they had been planning this attack for over a year and referred to it as Judgment Day. So that's going to do it, guys. Give me your reactions to these three stories in the comments section, and I will pin the best comment at the top. That picture still haunts me, too. Like, I knew about, I've been knew about Carbine High School shooting ever since um, 2014. I've been knew about that. It's just, it's just sad. It's just very sad, but <sighs> it's such a sad case. Hope everyone is like doing well. But yeah, hope you guys did enjoy, even though this was disturbing. And make sure to subscribe to Mr. Ball and make sure to subscribe to my like and comment. And I see you guys next time when I see ya. I got candy in my mouth, so sorry if you guys can't all hear me.